Brian. Today I'm going to present to you um, the story about um, a, a regional cooperative that was started about 15 years ago in 2016. Um, it's a cooperative in the southwest of the Netherlands, in the southwestern delta, which exists of, of uh, the pro province of Zeeland, part of Brabant and part of Flanders. What we have there now is a, a fully photosynthesis-based cooperative that focuses on the production of several products. It started, as I said, about 15 years ago with several local initiatives. You know, at that time there was many uh, local uh, citizens groups who started uh, local energy cooperatives. They wanted to be independent from uh, the large energy su suppliers and wanted to go for uh, local and sustainable energy production. There were quite a lot of those in, in the province of Ceylon. And they d discovered soon that, well, there was a need for a, kind of, uh, for a kind of platform, for a kind of cooperation. Because if you're too small, it's, it's hard to struggle with, well, the big companies who are not always your friends. Um, the idea was quite simple, to, um, to use the sun as, as a source of uh, power, as a source of well, producing all kinds of things. And as you can see here, sunshine is abundant. There is more than enough energy uh, reaching the, uh, the Earth, the planet Earth, um, m far more than we, we need, far more than, well, any other source of energy we have. And moreover, sun is, is um, well, it's not infinite, but um, it's, well, it's a renewable source, uh, different from coal, from gas, uh, or from nuclear power. So this is a, um, the, the basic idea is that using the sun is, is, is a good idea, um, uh, even not only at, at uh, regions that are close to the equator, but also uh, in, in northern parts in countries like the Netherlands. Uh, there is still uh, a lot of sun energy available. Um, well, back then, uh, we were using only a very tiny part of, of this solar energy in the form of uh, water power, hydropower, um, wind, a bit of uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, solar cells. Um, and uh, we were using a tiny bit of the total uh, energy coming from the sun uh, in, in terms of photosynthesis in plants. Um, another idea was, well, let's then, if, if we focus on solar energy, what's the best idea? What, what's the best kind of source to focus on? And if you look at this in terms of um, the acreage you need to produce sufficient uh, energy for households, for industry, etc. Well, then um, direct solar energy by um, PV panels um, is the best option. Wind is still a good option. Biomass is, well, it's not such a good option unless you use, um, well, the, the, the kind of waste products um, like well, this is not the case so much in, in, in the province of Ceylon, but there are other provinces where you have a lot of, um, where you have quite a bit of forest and where you have quite a bit of biomass that's uh, being left behind normally. Well, if you transport that and use it for energy production, that's still fine. But in Ceylon, we, we decided to focus on, on solar and wind, of course, because there is plenty of wind in that area. <coughs> Uh, we also did a bit of uh, biogas, uh, because there is farmers around who produce um, all kinds of materials that can be used for biogas production. Um, so this was a nice setup. This is how it started and this is how it gradually, gradually grew to, well, um, 
providing uh, the average household with, let's say, on average, up to 15% of uh, the energy need, just for the households. But after a while, we, we discovered, well, this is not going to work because uh, we cannot reach much more than this, maybe this 15%. Why is that? Uh, that's because, well, for instance, electricity is not suitable for trucks, for heavy transport. You still need fuels. It's not suitable for aviation. Um, there is also a problem with storing the energy surplus because you have not a, a, a constant energy production when you use solar energy and when you use wind. It, it fluctuates and, and you have to balance out this fluctuation in production with the demand. So um, you have to store, if you want to be completely uh, re renewable based on, on solar and wind energy, you have to store it. Well, storage is a problem because the batteries you need, um, you need heavy metals, um, which are scarce, for instance. Um, you could produce hydrogen from electricity, but that's not very efficient. Um, there is smart grid solutions where you uh, couple the systems, where you um, make smart systems using ICT uh, technologies to, um, to regulate the demand. So you can tell the machines to turn on when there is a lot of, uh, when there is a lot of wind, when there is a lot of sun. But you still need a central power plant to, to, to f balance the demand and uh, the supply, uh, which is usually a natural gas plant. Um, also, if you look at um, the, the, the energy that's coming from the sun and the energy you get out of those systems, then, um, well, the conversion rate is not that bad, but we could do and should do a lot better, I think. Also, if you look at biogas, biogas capacity is limited. Um, we cannot put all the biomass we have in biogas installations because if we do that, there is nothing left for food. So that's a bad idea. And that's the same for all kind of um, other bio-based uh, uh, energy solutions where you have uh, and, and certainly at that time, there was a strong debate uh, about whether this affects uh, the food supply or not. Uh, in addition, um, we still had a system of several uh, coal power plants uh, where uh, we used coal firing with, uh, with, with biomass. And actually, we already knew when we started that this was not a sustainable solution. So, uh, we were convinced that we were in need of uh, additional sustainable approaches to reach our goal of, well, let's say, the, the, the ultimate goal was to go for 100% renewable en energy. So, what to do? Well, this was by the end of the second decade. Um, we started discussions with um, several other actors in the region. First of all, uh, some agricultural and agro-food companies, like ZLTOs is, is, a, is a farmers' organization. Um, Groene Poort is, a, is an organization of farmers who, uh, who produce biogas and who are interested in, in, in producing um, all kinds of uh, energy. Royal Cosin is a, is a, a sugar corporation of, of farmers and Cargill you probably know, is, is a large importer and trader of, um, of grains and uh, of starch. We also uh, got in touch with several chemical industries in the region. Because these chemical industries, they, by that time, they were aware that um, the old-fashioned chemistry based on, um, on oil, the fossil chemistry, um, was not longer viable. There was a, a strong need for uh, new processes, 
um, with lower energy input, with uh, um, well based on on, on uh, green feedstock on, on on biomass, but in a responsible way, um, and also well trying to deal with waste in a, in a different way. An, an interesting example here, well, you, you probably know Dow and Hoogst and Shell and maybe Sabic. Sabic is, is a, also a big uh, petrochemical company uh, from Saudi Arabia and they have a, a plant in, uh, at, at the Moerdijk in, in, the, in, in Brabant. Um, Yara is an in interesting example here. Um, well, by tradition that was uh, a large producer of artificial fertilizers nitrogen-based uh, fertilizers. To make that, you need a lot of natural gas. That's not very sustainable in the end. You see, well, you have to put in a lot of energy anyhow. So this company already had started to look for differentiation and started to look for um, more biological ways of uh, uh, nitrogen fertilization uh, by means of plants and by means of microorganisms. And we also started to discuss with, um, well, the regional governments of uh, North Brabant and Zeeland because, well, it was clear to us that we also needed government support. And for these governments, the development of the region was an important issue. Um, by tradition, it was an agricultural re region which uh, developed some chemical industries in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, which also had a, um, a big uh, tourism, um, um, well, which attracted a lot of tourists at the coast. Um, and the province thought, well, this is not the way we can continue any longer. This is not um, good for the vitality of the region. So we need new options. We need a, a real kind of transition to go to a new kind of economy. So what we ended up with is, was uh, the idea of, of co-creation, do it together, not just by uh, ideological citizens who want to produce their own energy, uh, but together with industry, with governments, with ag agricultural organizations, etc. Do it in different places and try to make the whole region uh, sustainable, not only in terms of energy, but also in terms of chemistry and in terms of agriculture. Well, that was a big idea. How to do that? Um, well, when we discussed this, we, we came up with several new ideas. Well, some of them were not that new, uh, but still, uh, to many citizens, they were new. The idea of um, bio-based solutions, not in terms of a single solution, but a combination of solutions. So you can use the real value of, of the green matter that you use. Huh? Start with the, the high value first with, with pharmaceuticals and with food, then see what's left for fine chemicals to be used for the industry. And what, what's left in the end is, well, maybe some energy, some fuel you can retrieve from what's left and in the end, well, you can burn it, so you make energy. If you combine that in a good way, they call that cascading, um, well, you, you can be maybe profitable. Also look for new crops, new crops that can uh, not only provide the industry, for instance, with, um, with feedstock for producing, well, chemicals like rubber, uh, but also that provide new business models for farmers because the farmers had a real uh, hard time. Uh, they were really stressed by economic conditions. Um, a no waste approach, um, well that wasn't new neither, but still uh, this needed some further development. Use all components, no, that's not that easy. Uh, you have to set up recycling, you have to set up new production chains. Production chains that are no longer uh, linear, that begin with 
let's say, a seed and end at a consumer. But, well, there is, there is a cycle. You, you have to uh, think in cycles, also in terms of production chains. Um, and, of course, because it's Zeeland, there is a lot of water, there is a lot of salt water. Um, there is a lot of good conditions for um, aquaculture-based options. I'll tell you about that uh, a little more later. And we also th started thinking about, we, we heard about some bio-inspired solutions, uh, artificial photosynthesis. We thought, wow, this is, this is great, you know, this is something, well, if that works, r that's really great because uh, that does not com really compete anymore with, uh, with crops or whatever and can be e maybe even more efficient. So I'll talk a bit now about these two options. First of all, um, to be able to do this, we, we were convinced that we needed help from science. Um, and we had heard that there was um, a science program that had ended already, but that was uh, um, continued in, in a new way called biosolar cells. Uh, they developed um, all kind of science about photosynthesis, fundamental science, but also applied science, how to apply photosynthesis systems in plants, in algae, uh, and in artificial systems. Um, there was also um, a lot of knowledge, specific knowledge, about uh, algae, which was developed in, in Wageningen at the algae park, where they did a lot of experimentation with different strains of algae, see under what conditions they grow best and how they should be processed into all kind of different components. And also the help of several, well, I only mentioned here one, but there are sev were several European projects uh, at that time uh, which delivered a lot of information too. So algae, algae was interesting because uh, we had a few horticultural farmers who were interested in, in diversification of their production. And they were looking into, well, from uh, vegetables and flowers, they were looking into new areas like energy production. So they were looking whether uh, algae could be produced in greenhouses. Um, Algae were also interesting because um, algae can use um, all kind of industrial and household waste uh, that contain nutrients. They can use those nutrients. They live on salt water. Um, well, like fresh water. Um, well, in the Netherlands, we still have quite a bit of fresh water, but in other areas in the world, uh, fresh water is not always uh, uh, available in, um, in high quantities, but still, uh, well, and in, in, in Zeeland we have a lot of salt water. Um, there was the need, though, to to do something about the product productivity of the algae. So we, we needed high productive uh, strains uh, that could also produce specific components that were interesting for industry. Um, well. Scientists in, in Wageningen and in other universities were able to produce these kind of algae by that time uh, using genetic modification or even synthetic biology. Um, well, we were aware that w that would could trigger a, so, some debate, but um, this is why we, we discussed this with environmental organizations before we started the project. And we found out that there were actually no real objections, there were some slight objections, but not, not real objections, not like against genetically modified plants, uh, because these algae were produced in, in closed systems, in containment. Uh, we also discussed with um, the Vegetarians Association and the Consumers Association uh, whether they would object against the use of uh, food ingredients derived from these algae. And they did not object because they were really convinced about our story that this was a sustainable way of producing proteins, for instance. Um, 
Another part was uh, seaweed. Well, uh, seaweed is also something you can grow on salt water. Um, the first sea farms were started producing seaweed. Um, and seaweed, from seaweed you can produce all kind of nice products. Not in the least maybe um, some, some seaweed vodka, um, which is um, on Friday afternoon always available at our office. The second part is about artificial photosynthesis. And this is something really different. This is not bio-based, this is bio-inspired or biomimic mimicry, if you want. It's about, well, looking how nature works, how, how plants uh, or some microorganisms use sunlight to convert it in, into uh, chemical uh, energy um, and build that in an artificial way using different kinds of technologies like uh, nanotechnology, uh, also synthetic bi biology, um, and in the end uh, use it to split uh, water into uh, hydrogen and, and oxygen. This is a complete CO2 neutral approach. Um, and well, the scientists told us that um, in theory, um, efficiencies of 35, 40% use of the, of the energy from sunlight was possible, which is far more than uh, plants do, which is between 1 and 2%, and which is also far more than, um, well, still the advanced uh, photovoltaic solar panels we know nowadays do, which is, well, around 20%. Well, this is the global, global idea of, of uh, artificial uh, photosynthesis. Um, here it, it is compared in a nice graphic that appeared. Uh, well, this is, this is almost 17 or 18 years ago it appeared, maybe 20, 20 in 2010. Um, this was the basic idea. You use the photons from the sunlight, you, you, you you catch them, uh, you, you, you use a kind of antenna to catch up, uh, to, to catch these uh, photons, um, then uh, transfer them into, um, into uh, electrical energy and use this electrical energy, energy in catalysis to split water and produce hydrogen. Another important point about any energy technology is scale. If you want to meet the scale or challenge of doing something equivalent to building a new nuclear power plant every single day, which is what it would take to cut carbon dioxide emissions in 40 years accounting for population growth, if you want to do that with solar we would have to be thinking about not a million solar roofs in 10 years but a million solar roofs every single day. We don't want to have panels that are treated like glass museum pieces that are held up delicately on your roof in order to install them and people that have to have high voltage, high current experience hooking them up to the grids. We have ways to roll this stuff out like carpet that you buy from Home Depot and that could be really cheap material that doesn't need installers and doesn't need electrical grid hookup and the input feeds are just water and CO2 from the air and then you would collect the product in a similar way to how you think about recirculating hot water through a solar hot water heater or through something that heats swimming pools and so although we don't have a product we have something that does have the looks, feel, and touch that it sounds pretty cheap and sounds like if we can make it with the three things that we need, inexpensive materials, efficient systems, and things that last a long time so they don't have to be replaced, then we would have the three ingredients of a pretty nice puzzle. Remember, this was, this was 20 years ago, yeah? Um, and he said, we don't have a product yet. Well, the products are not there yet, but they are about to come um, in the next few years, we think. 
uh, well, th this, is, this is the kind of future we envisage. Um, with this kind of system, you can make every household uh, a solar fuel farm. You don't only produce your own energy, you can also supply others with the energy surplus. You can even supply um, chemical industry with, well, some of the material they need. Moreover, uh, this system is, well, of course it's, it's working when the sun shines, but by night, um, well, you, you, can, you can store it. So by night, you can still use the energy you need. This is our dream. This is our dream. And this is a dream we thank to nature. We are grateful to nature because nature has provided us with the system and the insight of how photosynthesis works. You know, nature, in, in my view, um, is an art in, the, in itself. Innovation is also a kind of art, you know? Innovation is, is, a, is a creative process. Um, nature and innovation, combining these two, in my view, is a creative process, is a piece of art. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Haap de Vriend, uh, for this nice vision, Quantum Leap into the Future. Um, I, I have one question, actually. Um, can you tell a little bit about the major hurdles you had to, uh, uh, to come by? I mean, um, uh, this is quite a success story, it all yeah. works, but um, we are now actually uh, in, in 2013, and we're not there yet, and we were wondering, um, what are we doing wrong at present? Um, how can we get there? Yeah. What do we have to do? Well, th there is a few hurdles. Um, we encountered. One of them was when, when we started working with um, these algae, these genetic, genetically modified algae, you need permits for using genetically modified organisms. You know, these permits are quite time consuming and quite costly, although in this case it, it concerns permits for uh, contained use, you know, not for putting a plant in the field, which is even far more expensive. So, for small and medium um, uh, enterprises, uh, th this makes it difficult to deal with, you know. Uh, if, if a horticul horticultural farmer wants to do something with genetically modified algae in, it, in, in his or her greenhouse, well, this is a hurdle. Uh, we solve this by talking with, with uh, authorities. Um, and well, discussing whether we, we could get more kind of general permits uh, that could be used by several uh, entrepreneurs at the same time. So that's one of the advices you have for us as yeah. entrepreneurs, uh, yeah. group together and get your permits done. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning uh, that you work together with uh, large uh, multinational companies, for example Shell, the yeah. company that's at the other uh, side of the street, um, not talking about renewables actually, no. but about the last bits of oil that's below yes. sea level. Um, how did you do that? How did you get them at the table? These companies have always have two faces, you know? And, um, well, the, the one face is, is indeed, the, the, well, it's the kind of big company uh, um, interests that are still, um, in 2013, still in, in fossil fuels, you know? Shell is, going for natural gas, for shale gas. Um, same goes for BP, for t well, for all these companies, because that's where they can earn money, and where they, where they can earn it fast, you know? Um, these but solutions you were quite are long successful. Term. You did get them at the table. We did How get did them at that? the table, because it was the, the chemical companies, and it, it were not the energy company, it was the, the, the chemical divisions of the companies who were really facing problems with uh, expensive energy, um, unsustainable uh, feedstock supply, uh, increasing pressure, in, increasing taxes on, on, uh, on these unsu on unsustainable supplies. So uh, they were also looking for new solutions. 
Um, their traditional reaction, of course, was to start talking with the other institutions, the, the, the ones they know already, you know, the, the farmers' organizations and uh, government institutions, not with citizens' groups. But when we turned up, they had to get used to us, and, and we had to find within these companies also the right people, because companies is, it's, it's not a, a kind of, uh, there is people in companies, and there is always people working in companies who, um, who want to do the right thing. So talk so, with them and try to convince them. And okay, but you were most uh, satisfied with your collaborations with the scientists, I understand. Yeah, although there was, uh, there, there was also a, a, a hurdle with, uh, in, in, in working with scientists because, um, well, we had to de deal with intellectual property rights and with patents. And um, that's, not, that's not a problem as long as, uh, as a patent is very specific. But there, um, we, we had to deal with some patents um, that were filed in, in the United States or by U.S. Um, uh, uh, institutes um, concerning, well, very broad applications and, and, and actually the, the photosynthesis uh, synthesis system at, at large and all, all kind of applications thereof. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a kind of pattern that, well, that blocks other innovation. So we, we had to f find a way around these patterns. Uh, which was you managed to do so? Uh, we're still working, working on that. Yeah. Good that's lawyers. That, that, yeah, and they're expensive. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the people from the biosolar program in the Netherlands? Yeah, they were good help, really. Yeah, uh, yeah they were great help. Um, yeah, we, well, we really needed this, the, the knowledge they have, the, the kind of uh, science they, um, they produced. Um, and especially, of course, the, the applications. Huh? And to, to, well, not just applications that can be applied in, in, in large industrial systems, but also applications <coughs> that can be applied at small scale. And they were really helpful in... in, in, in Do you know Jeremy Harbinson? Yeah, I know him quite well. Oh, well, yeah. he's here. We, we, we travel back in time. Uh, yeah. I'd like to give yeah. the floor. Yeah. Uh, so he, he will oh, tell oh, you oh, more oh, about oh, the... Oh. Hi, oh, there, I didn't know. Thank you.